All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with John Gablehausen. We're, it's August 3rd, 2020. We're at Alexandra in Dundee. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, first question and most important question for our purposes is why wine? Why not, right? It's, in my opinion, the most fascinating beverage there is out there to drink. Um, it tells the story of the place it was grown and there's so many different varietals. It's like the international language. It's spoken in all countries, all religions. Uh, it's cross-cultural and it's just fascinating. So tell me about your kind of initial interest and in kind of life before wine. Sure, so I grew up in a tiny town in northwestern Montana where there's absolutely no wine and no grapes. I didn't grow up in a family that was interested in wine. Uh, we grew up in a lot of land up in the mountains. And, you know, I had a, a great childhood growing up in the mountains, um, doing a lot of fishing, climbing, hiking. I raced uh, motorcycles as well growing up. So my parents took me all over the country racing uh, competitively. It was a lot of fun. Um, when I graduated high school, I wanted to go and get out of Montana and go to a really big college. And I looked at a lot of business programs and settled with University of Nebraska. A lot of people don't realize that that's where Warren Buffett went to college. And if you can imagine how much money he donates to the CBA <laughs> program there, it's astonishing. Uh, so. Some of my friends and I decided to go to University of Nebraska and I focused on management, marketing, international economics, and a little bit of business law. Had a great time in college and while I was there, started working in restaurants and I, that would be my first interaction with wine as a lot of people do when they go to college. You uh, start experimenting with different beverages as you become of age and you start drinking beer and hard alcohol and sometimes wine. And when I was working in restaurants, I was a chef for a couple years. Um, I bartended, uh, but at one restaurant in particular in Lincoln, Nebraska, the restaurant was called Vincenzo's and I, I got a bartending job there. Really nice high-end Italian restaurant and there was just copious amounts of wine they were serving and I knew nothing about wine. Uh, but I was serving it and that was really my first glimpse into the wine world. One of the customers allowed me to try a Tigniello, one of the first Super Tuscans. And well, one, I, I saw the price tag on it and I couldn't believe how expensive it was. <laughs> but two, I, I drank it and I, I thought, wow, so this comes from a vine? comes, you know, it's, it's grown in Italy. And the more I started asking questions, I realized there was over a thousand grape varietals in Italy. And it was just a really unique, interesting beverage that I wanted to learn more about. So that was really my first introduction with wine, but I didn't know at that point that that was going to be the career path I was going to take. I was really focused on, on business and business management. So as time went on, I, I still, remembered that experience I had with Tigniello and ended up graduating college. Uh, slowly was getting more interested in wine, but just casually reading, you know, Wine Spectator. I was starting to pick up some textbooks and read about wine in that way, uh, looking at different examples of wine grown around the world, but still not, it was more of a, a kind of a hobby pastime. Mm -hmm. And after I graduated college, uh, my family and I went to the Virgin Islands for a family vacation. And it was so interesting while we were down there for two weeks, it was my mother who had said to me, John, you know what, you finished college, this will be the only time in your life, why don't you stay down here for a year before you come back to, you know, and then you can come back to the United States get into your career because once you start that, you're gonna end up getting married, you know, have a wife and kids and you're just gonna be grinding, working and whatever, you know, that might be. So I thought, you know what? 
all right, I'm going to do it. So without knowing anybody, I went back to Montana, grabbed some stuff, flew back to the Virgin Islands. A lot of people don't realize where that's at. Uh, it's closer to Venezuela than it is Miami, so it's pretty far south. It's still a U.S. territory, but uh, completely different than uh, what the United States is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in all aspects you can imagine. So I moved down there without knowing anyone, and I said, I'm going to give myself a year. And that's really the start, I, I guess, of my heavy interest uh, in the wine industry, which you think that doesn't make sense in the Virgin Islands. And so when I went down there, within two weeks, I found a job, a place to live, and I bought this junk car. I, I didn't have hardly any money, so I really had to stretch it out. Um, really needed to get that job so I could pay rent, that type of thing. Um, I remember getting my car, it was so hot down there, and my car didn't have air conditioning and one of the windows wouldn't even roll down and there was like this fan screwed into the dash that plugged into my cigarette lighter. Um, great time in my life. But my first job I, I got down there, I was right out of college, was uh, I, I went to one of the busiest restaurants in St. Thomas. And I thought, okay, you know what, maybe I'll just bartend for a year and hang out, I'm in the Caribbean. And I thought, you know what, I, I have my college degree, I might as well apply for management. So that's what I did. I applied for management. I was very, very young and got the job as a manager. So now I'm managing a fairly big staff and there's a lot of tourists coming in and out of there. You know, there's cruise ship passengers coming into the restaurant. It wasn't a really fancy restaurant nor did they have a lot of wine, but because I was in a really uh, well-paid position right out of college at a young age, I could now afford buying examples of different varietals from around the world. <clears throat> so I was at that restaurant for about three years and was saving up enough money that on my vacations, because of my location in the Caribbean, I could easily go to Burgundy or Italy um, for a long weekend, uh, but still, you know, kind of going there and finding the cheapest hotel I could or staying in a hostel or, um, just trying to get exposure to these wine regions for fun. And after a few years in the restaurant, obviously I realized that I didn't want that to be my career. And I was learning more about wine and I thought, you know what, this is what I want to do. And I made that decision that I wanted to focus on wine. Uh, and I, was, I started reading more books. I would heard about a book called Hugh Johnson's World Atlas of Wine. Um, Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia, mm -hmm. which are, I highly recommend those two books. Uh, Kevin Zarelli's Windows of the World is a good book to start with. And in the, you know, in, when you start to get in the wine industry with a business degree, there isn't, there is now, back then there wasn't as many classes you could take for wine education. Uh, it was more of a self-taught profession. And so I had come I had met someone that worked at the Ritz-Carlton who then introduced me to a master sommelier. I had no idea what that word was, what that title was. This is back in the uh, early 2000s, so quite some time ago. And so I started looking into what a sommelier was and was able to talk to a couple master sommeliers back then, William Schreer being one of them, and he was working at a restaurant in Vegas called Ariel, and he had these, this huge wine cellar and these wine angels. It's a pretty cool concept. Massive wine cellar in Vegas. And they had told me that you should read these, these books that I had mentioned. So in starting to study wine, these, these books really started to give me my, my knowledge and understanding of varietals around the world, wine laws, a process of making wine. And again, I was just doing it my free time. So after about three years of living in the Virgin Islands, I moved back to Montana, where I grew up in Missoula, Montana, and just kind of didn't know where to go. So I thought, why don't I go back home for a little bit and got a job at a wine shop. And you think to yourself, how much wine is in Missoula, Montana? And the wine shop was called Warden's Market. It's still there. Uh, 
It was owned by Tim France, and there was a gentleman in there that had worked in the wine department for a long time. His name was Chris Neiswanger. And interesting enough, where I grew up in Montana, there's not a lot of people, but there is a lot of tourists coming in to go to Glacier National Park or Yellowstone. Um, there's a lot of wealthy people coming into that part of Montana to take vacations. Will they have the disposable income to buy really nice wines? So this wine shop was kind of a market. It had deli sandwiches, it sold beer, but it did have a pretty robust wine program. And they sold a lot of wines from France. I remember uh, my first experience with Chateau Neuf de Pop and that little wine shop there. Uh, a lot of wines from Spain and Bordeaux and a little bit of Champagne. Um, Germany was represented, Austria, California, Washington. So now I'm getting exposed to old world wines uh, and, the, and the Tim France that had owned Warden Market ended up leasing out this space underneath that he turned in, he put some money into it and turned in, into a wine cave of sorts where customers could go down. And we started hosting these wine tastings, which quite frankly, I, you know, I'm just learning about wine, interested in it, but it was a part of that process of creating that uh, part kind of building out that part of the company for him. Uh, and it was just kind of learning on the fly, right? I was reading as much as I could. I was trying wines with the distributor that would bring it in. And I was talking to customers about wine and what they liked and what they didn't like and starting to interact with customers on uh, what their preferences were and what they thought about wine and fine tuning I guess that was the start of understanding how to sell wine mm -hmm. and understanding people's descriptors of what they liked and what I was recommending of what I thought they would like if they liked uh, Chateau Reyes or Chateau Bocastel, then I thought they might like Clos Loratois from the Rhone Valley type of thing. Uh, and I did that for quite some time, you know, uh, really intensely studying wine. I was in Montana for about nine months and some of my friends that I had known in the Caribbean um, had contacted me and said, we just took over a, a, a restaurant that we'd like you to come back and help us build out the wine program. They'd heard I'd been studying wine. And that restaurant was called, uh, it's still there, the Old Stone Farmhouse. And it's owned by Neil and Trudy Pryor. And a, a couple, they're still dear friends of mine, uh, Brian and Julia Katz had taken over the lease from Neil and Trudy who owned the business. And Brian Katz was an amazing chef, an executive chef. And so they, they were doing some remarkable things. This, this restaurant was unbelievable. It was located on the golf course in St. Thomas. It had a lot of history in, in the rum uh, mm -hmm. world because it was a 200 year old rum plantation. And if you can imagine this, this 200 year old stone farmhouse in the Virgin Islands that has connections to a distillery, how beautiful this was. And their wine program, they had the money to build it out and it already had a healthy, healthy selection that Julia Katz had kind of done, but I was gonna start working with her to build it out even further. And the beauty of the Virgin Islands, you th again think to yourself, that's a strange place to get into wine. But there's so many people from all over the world in particular, all these different countries in Europe, all these different states in the United States, vacationing to the Caribbean, mm -hmm. that each one of these regions around the world and these customers that were coming into the restaurant had different interests in wine from all over the world. And because of that, you kind of wanted to build out a pretty in-depth wine list. Mm -hmm. So it was really focused, focused heavily on old world, um, so I flew back to the Virgin Islands to live and became the sommelier of the Old Stone Farmhouse. And that's where it really kicked into high gear because there was distributors that would come up to meet me every week, wine distributors, mm -hmm. trying to sell me wine, uh, tell me, you know, here's my new, new wine I have. But after you know, a few months, I'm like, wow, they keep bringing me four to five wines every week. I'm replacing wines that I sold out that week. 
trying to mix it up. The chef had this really interesting, on top of just an a la carte menu, we offered a wine pairing dinner mm -hmm. where you could do four, five, and six courses. And each one of those courses every night was paired with a different wine from around the world to complement that dish. So every night now, I'm really looking at the components of complementing or contrasting each dish with a wine and a varietal from around the world. So I'm, I'm not using the same wine night after night. So at any given time, I could have my wines by the glass, you know, which was roughly, depending on what seat time of year it was, up to 10 wines by the glass, plus another seven to 10 wines for the pairing menu open at any given time, really eccentric varietals from around the world uh, with some traditional wines. So understanding now, not only how to build out a wine program with wines that didn't compete with each other, but also looking at price points. I was very conscious on um, uh, beverage costs for the restaurant, um, but still trying to find an interesting program that offered some sort of value to the customers uh, to try to, uh, you know, offer some really cool ex eccentric things, but some also some cult wines. But as I said, these distributors are bringing four to five wines every week. And finally it dawned on me, I said, I can really hone in my, my tasting palette here. So then I, I told these distributors, these sales reps, I don't want you to tell me what wine it is. I want you to come in now and pour these wines every week for me blind. Remember now there's, there's three to four distributors every week coming to me, mm -hmm. each one of them carrying you know, two to six wines in their bag, sometimes more, and also some weeks bringing a winemaker from a different part of the world, as distributors do, they mm -hmm. bring in you know, ride whisks with uh, people from a winery, whether it be a sales rep or an owner or a winemaker. So now I'm interacting directly with these winemakers and these owners, but also blind tasting, uh, you know, 20 plus wines a week just with the distributors and honing in my palate of trying to figure out what the, the varietal was, the quality level, what kind of oak it was in, um, the region, the vintage. And so every week just hitting it hard uh, while also working on the floor selling wine from a couple thousand dollars a bottle all the way down to inexpensive wines. Mm -hmm. It was hands down uh, probably the most intense time in my life for learning wine, mm -hmm. but it was fast tracked. I remember, oh, another really good book I would recommend is I had just the basic uh, wine encyclopedia. It's, it's a, or a wine Bible. It's an encyclopedia. It's a, it's a little tiny thick book mm -hmm. that I had back by my wine cellar when I would talk to a customer about wine or try to pair something and there, you know, there was a, a word I didn't know or a grape varietal I didn't know. On my way to the wine cellar, I'd quickly look it up and you like, okay, okay, I, I got it, I got it. And then I would go out and talk. So I was learning a lot mm -hmm. uh, very f quickly on the fly. And I think that that time in my life was um, really the deciding factor of me saying, okay, this is exciting, it's fun, it's a fascinating business, and this is what I wanna do. Um, and that, that's really where I got involved in, um, with other, other uh, starting to learn more about what I could do within wine for my education. Mm -hmm. I had learned about the WSET program. So I had went through that. There happened to be a, a, a guy, I, he's not a master of wine, but pretty close to it, that was a wine broker living down there. So I went through the WSET program with him, which was great. It gives you a good understanding and foundation of what that is and the CSW as well. Mm -hmm. um, I also got introduced because Again, there's some fascinating people you meet in the Caribbean, and there is a food and wine society. A lot of people know about it. It's not, I don't want to say it's a secret food and wine society, but I'm surprised to hear how many people don't know about it. It's called the Chendor de Sur. And the Chendor de Sur was a food and wine society that was established in, I believe, in Paris in the 1800s. And what it is, is 
there's chapters all over the world from Saint Tropez to Dubai to Zurich, Switzerland, India, uh, the Virgin Islands, New York, Tokyo, all over the world. And you have to be invited into this, I, w I guess it's a society, you have to be invited and sponsored by a couple people. It's very expensive dues, but once you get into this, you're, it opens a really interesting door because it's well-to-do people that are into having an elevated food, food and wine experience. So once a month, these chapters all over the world hold these epic wine dinners. And so I'm now in my 20s, late 20s, get introduced and get uh, inducted into the Chandra Tassur. And they have a, a, a wine committee or a wine society within that called L'Ordre du Mondial that I end up becoming as, associated with. Now I'm going to um, um, the sommelier at the old stone farmhouse. And by the way, there wasn't any sommeliers in the Caribbean at the time in the Virgin Islands. Um, so I'm getting a lot of attention and it's a lot of fun. Now I'm in the Chandra Tassur and L'Ordre du Mondial where we're hosting these uh, once a month, these tuxedo wine dinners that are four to five hundred dollars a person. Um, and now I'm experiencing first, second, third growth Bordeaux, some of the most expensive wines you can imagine in the world that are paired with each course. And these dinners are up to like 70 people. In between each course, there's someone dinging the glass, standing up, the executive chef walks out, talks you know, passionately about the food that was created for that course and where it was sourced. And, and then the person that selected the wines is talking in depth about that wine region and the varietal. And that guy was named uh, Kerry Tannenbaum. And he was in the process of moving back to the US and so he said, I think John should be the officer within the Shindor to certain Lord de Mondial because uh, he saw my passion to take over selecting the wines for the Shindor to Sir. So now I'm still the sommelier at, at the Old Stone Farmhouse. Um, and now I'm selecting the wines for the Shindor to Sir and Lord de Mondial. And, you know, I, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything because that that allowed me uh, to taste wines that I could never afford, ever, ever afford, in a way that people only dream of, mm -hmm. of trying, you name it, Harlan, Colgan, Bryant, uh, Senquinon, the most expensive wines around the world. Uh, I tried a lot of Domaine Romani Conti, things that it's just, you can't find or, or get. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a great time in my life, to say the least. Uh, we had also, I started getting into other beverages at that time, S studying scotch and bourbon, uh, sake, and of course rum. And so I, I took a liking to rum because being in the Caribbean and learning about the history of rum and the triangle trade and how rum's made with molasses and it, how it ties into um, slavery and really studying that part of uh, our history it was it was really really cool to learn about rum in that way because I had access to the distilleries in the Caribbean um, the chef was fascinating and he negotiated a deal with celebrity cruise lines and all these cruise ships that are coming into the Caribbean to do these shore excursions. So I don't know if you've ever taken a cruise, but when you're on a cruise ship on Thursdays, you can do a shore excursion where you go, you know, kayaking or hiking on whatever island you're at. Well, at the Old Stone Farmhouse, the restaurant I was in, we pitched it to the cruise lines that come in and we'll do a, uh, a food cooking demonstration for you. And then we'll talk about rum and pair different down island rums with these courses. So Brian Katz, the chef, you know, we're like, we can do this. So we'd have up to 50 people off the cruise ship on Thursdays out in the courtyard. And he bought this chef's table with, you know, the induction stove and the mirror behind him that the people could see. And he would do these, you know, three courses, 
Caribbean inspired courses like sugar cane skewered shrimp and mafungo from Puerto Rico and all these really cool dishes. And then I was talking about rum, the history of rum, how rum's made, different styles of rum. And then we were trying uh, four to five different down island rums with each course. And so that was, that was really, really cool. Um, you know, we, we were written up in the New York Times. Uh, it, was, it was, again, a, it, one of these uh, things that I never anticipated doing in my life, but just m the course I decided to take and where I was, I guess I was just honestly in the right place at the right time to get these experiences. And so that was fantastic. I loved it, but I deep down knew I didn't want to just be a sommelier and work the floor you're going in at 11 o'clock in the afternoon and finishing work at one in the morning. They're long hours, but after three years, uh, I wanted to do something else within the wine industry and really try to broaden my knowledge and experience uh, in looking at different things you can do. And so I decided to, I had heard about this project that was gonna open up in the Caribbean, but I thought, you know what? Um, at, now at that time I knew uh, a, a good amount about wine and things like that around the world. So I opened a wine consulting company on my own, still living in the Virgin Islands. And I did that for about nine months and what it was, I was consulting now for the distributors down in the Caribbean and educating their staff, the wine reps, how to sell wine, how to talk to restaurants, how to talk to wine buyers, different varietals, and now I'm starting to take uh, trips when I was a wine consultant down to South America because I was really interested in Argentina and Chile and Argentina in particular. Uh, there was no wines from Argentina in the Caribbean and it was very cheap down there, right? I'm still not making a whole lot of money as a sommelier and now a consultant, I'm not making hardly anything. You know, when you decide to get in the wine industry, sometimes uh, you're you're struggling because you're not, you're, you're trying to make ends meet. Uh, at least that was my case. Um, so I was now consulting, but I wanted to learn more about Argentina. I knew how cheap it was down there. So I started going to Argentina. This was, this was in the, again, the early 2000s. I think 2002 or 2003 was the first time I traveled down there and started tasting wines in Argentina and learning about Mendoza and that region. And then, you know, I, I remember tasting a wine from a, a winery by the name of Dolium down there and Tarazas and some of these wines that are doing some really cool stuff and Luigi Bosco. And talking to the owners of those wineries and saying, listen, I know the distributors, I have a wine consulting company. Um, I think your wines would be amazing in the Caribbean, we should bring them down. So I started brokering wines in the Caribbean while I was still consulting. Uh, and basically brokering is just making that introduction with, hey, this is a really cool wine and you're not in this location talking to the brand manager of the distributing company, hey, let's, this is a hole in your portfolio. You don't have this varietal or this region or this price point. I think it would do really well. So. Uh, you know, I started brokering wines into the Caribbean and I was a wine consultant for about nine months and there was these gentlemen that wanted to create this uh, really unique property in the Virgin Islands. So these two guys had these, you know, they're very wealthy from the United States. They had these, these huge yachts and I'm not talking the 200 foot yachts, but more of the four and 500 foot boats. And they were so sick and tired of when you have these huge mega yachts, you go into the Caribbean or somewhere and they're too big, you can't dock them <laughs> in these marinas. The, the port's not big enough, so they'd have to anchor them offshore and dinghy in. And also these, these marinas were not up to snuff of, you know, they're on a five-star boat, but the marina's two-star. Mm -hmm. You know, the Caribbean is unforgiving with its weather and its hurricane, so uh, there wasn't these glamorous, fancy marinas like you would expect. So they just said, decided to start a company called Island Global Yachting, and they wanted to build their flagship marina 
in St. Thomas Virgin Islands called Yacht Haven Grand. And I started consulting for them because Brian Katz, who was the executive chef at the restaurant at the Old Stone Farmhouse, got a job as their executive chef to help them build out. So what Yacht Haven Grand was gonna be was to be able to um, fit 57 mega yachts in the marina. It also was building these beautiful condos that were selling for a million dollars. And then there was a lot of retail outlets like Salvador Ferragamo and uh, Louis Vuitton and Gucci. Um, also had three restaurants as well. And then a provisioning list where when these yachts come in to the marina, when, you know, let's say someone wants to rent one of these boats, they'll, they'll pay a million dollars to rent the yacht for a week, but that doesn't include their, their food or their drinks or their fuel. So they would need to go to a provisioning department to get the boat outfitted for whatever that guest wanted. But also the, these restaurants, so Brian Katz was trying to create these menus and help them design these restaurants. And guess what, they, you know, there was these beverage programs and really cool cocktails that needed to be created. And they were looking to build out their wine program. So that's where I came to play. They called me, I started consulting with them for a few months and then they ended up hiring me full time as their beverage director. So I had left uh, you know, closed down my consulting company, started with Yacht Haven Grand, and now I'm working at this startup company. They're building these restaurants. I'm a part of trying to design and help the, the you know, the front end of it, hiring people. So we're, we're doing these, um, you know, huge setting up interviews and I'm talking to 200 plus people trying to staff all of, all of these restaurants, trying to come up with beverage programs, I'm negotiating with the distributors, everything that goes into a startup restaurant of picking out what kind of alcohol you want, what kind of beer, negotiating good deals for that, looking at your beverage costs, so really utilizing my, uh, what I went to college for, in management and accounting and finance, but also my love of wine, so that was where it was really exciting because these, on top of doing these fun things for these restaurants, I'm starting to provision these, these yachts. Well, I can't even describe, you know, these people didn't have a budget, number one, and they want what they wanted. So if I couldn't find what I, what, you know, what wine, particular Barolo or Barbaresco they wanted, I would call Italy, I would call the winery directly. You know, I, I had whatever funds I needed to fly in the wine. Uh, so that, that was an interesting time. Plus these, these yachts, by the way, are so large that one of them in particular, out of privacy for them, I don't wanna say the name of the boat, it's so large that there would be a crew of 44 people <laughs> living on the boat just to maintain it. And, and typically these are Kiwis or Aussies living on the boat well, they drink wine too. So I'm selling, you know, 10 cases, five, 10 cases a week to the, the crew and educating them on how to pour wine and do all that. Plus provisioning these people that were renting the yacht um, and managing the front end of all of these restaurants. We're throwing huge events on the property. It, you know, it's an esplanade. I remember our grand opening, we had the Beach Boys play and all the yachts and fireworks going off and I had 12 satellite bars set up around the property with wine and Krug champagne and the restaurants running it. So there was, you know, two, 250 people, employees trying to manage that with 3,000 guests at these events and trying to make sure everything flowed properly. Um, we brought back our our shore excursions at one of the restaurants, so we're doing that as well. Uh, it was a crazy time in my life, to <laughs> say the least. Uh, I didn't sleep a lot. The gentleman that owned it, it, was the company was based in New York, so even though you think, geez, you're in the Caribbean, it's supposed to be laid back in these beautiful beaches, which most people go down there for that and to work in that way where it's just uh, really relaxed, it wasn't. Um, I felt like I was working in Manhattan, my phone, an email was blowing up constantly. Um, 
managing all these people. And at that time, I really started, uh, I was still being exposed to a lot of really cool wines from around the world, but also started dabbling with uh, infusing alcohol, mm -hmm. infusing mm -hmm. in particular vodka and tequila with other things. And for one of the, one of the restaurants called Grand Cru, I had a really unique beverage program at all, all the restaurants there, Wicked, Fat Turtle, and Grand Cru. But Grand Cru, I wanted these really interesting martinis and drinks. So I would do things like infuse cilantro in, in a batch of vodka and then in salute, you know, um, infuse pineapple. So I'd have a pineapple cilantro drink or I would do mangoes and chili peppers. So I had that sweet and spicy thing going on. I remember breaking down the components of chai tea, which I love, and looking at each component of chai tea and infusing that into vodka separately and then blending it together and really understanding how that worked and the timing of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so that was, that was fun to, to do that, but after, uh, geez, I worked there three years, I felt that I was further away from wine than I wanted. I'm managing a lot of people. Um, I was dealing with all sorts of beverages, which I, I love, but really wanted to get back to wine. And so I didn't know what I wanted to do, right? I have this great job with this company at Yacht Haven Grand. Um, they're buying marinas around the world. They buy Montauk in New York. They buy the marina in Cot the marina in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. They build the marina in Dubai. Uh, they own like 25 marinas around the world. But I just, again, wanted to leave that because wine was pulling me harder than it ever has in my life at that, at that point. Like, I really wanted to refocus my time and energy. And so I'm like, geez, I still want to live in the Caribbean, but what else is there to do? Well, the, the closest thing you can do at that point with not working directly at a winery is working for the distributor. I thought, okay, well maybe I can go back, the distributing company I was consulting for, maybe they would hire me. Um, just right place at the right, right time, I think blind luck, my phone rings, and I remember this day so well. I'm, I'm standing in the restaurant Grand Cru, it's a crazy day, and my phone rings and I, I answer it, and it's these gentlemen from North Carolina. And they say, hey, John, you don't know us, but we've heard about you. Uh, we own a distributing company in North Carolina, and we're looking to open one in the Virgin Islands. We vacation down there. We love it. We see a need for more wine down there. We heard you're you know, the only sommelier in the Caribbean, and you know more about wine than anyone else down there. Would you be willing to not only partner with us, but have some sweat equity and some ownership of this distributing company and set it up and do it? And I said, uh, you know what? Yeah, I think this sounds like a good idea. So before I agreed, I took a flight to North Carolina. I met with them. Um, they had a great, great distributing company there called Dionysus Distributing, the Greek god of wine. The Roman god is called Bacchus, same person. So Dionysus Distributing, they already had the relationships with all of these wineries from all over the world. They, they represented pretty much every wine growing region in, in Europe and the United States. Had sakes, had some other things. Um, I said, this is great guys. We struck a deal. I said, let's do it. I went back to the Virgin Islands. I quit my job at Yacht Haven Grand and I started Dionysus Distributing from scratch. So what we were doing was consolidating containers, 40 foot containers of wine <laughs> in North Carolina, choosing what wines we felt would work in the Caribbean price points, building out a, a price book. I was consolidating wines there, putting them on a cargo ship and shipping a 40 foot container, refrigerated by the way. So now I'm learning about import and export and transit over ocean with wine. <laughs> uh, and You'd be surprised how many people do uh, containers and shipments overseas to pick a place in the world, wherever there's wine sold all over the world. They've got to get it from a winery. Uh, they're not using refrigerated containers. 
They're usually thermal wrapped is what they like mm -hmm. to say. Thermal wrap, I don't believe in the thermal wrap really protects the wine. You need, you need a refrigerated container where you set the temperature. It's a little more cost, but quite frankly, not that much considering the product you have in that container. Mm -hmm. So we start shipping refrigerated containers into the Virgin Islands. Now I have to set up yet another company. So the process to establish a business in an LLC and get permits and licensing and to find a warehouse and get the proper equipment of air conditioning and racking systems and now hiring people for that, figuring out how to who do I even call? How do I even put it on the boat once it leaves North Carolina? I gotta find a trucking company to pick it up at their distributing company, truck it to Miami or the coast of North Carolina, do all the bill of lading, all the paperwork, figure out how to get it onto this huge cargo ship, the timetable it's gonna take to get it to the Virgin Islands, how I'm gonna offload it, who I'm gonna get in the Caribbean to offload it and drive it to my warehouse, it, it was so much fun. And thank goodness, so Jay Garland and Shane Wilder were the two gentlemen uh, that owned Dionysus Distributing and gave me that opportunity. I was very fortunate throughout my life to have a lot of people give me opportunities um, when I may not have had that experience quite yet, but, uh, but I you know, was, was gonna learn it on the fly. Mm -hmm. um, so they gave me that opportunity to build out Dionysus with them and they had talked uh, to folks that they knew in North Carolina to move down and help me in the, you know, Dennis and Donna Cheatham. So they really helped me. Dennis was the warehouse manager and was the warehouse manager in North Carolina. So he kind of knew how to manage that part. We hired a, you know, a couple delivery people. So now we have this warehouse. I have containers of wine coming in and I'm running and it was just me selling, collecting, delivering until we hired more people. I'm opening up accounts in restaurants and hotels and duty-free shops and, and selling wine uh, to these people and trying to keep inventory and stock and flowing and starting to host wine dinners now, which I was very comfortable with uh, hosting a wine dinner because I, I did so many wine dinners and spoke um, in public a lot from the Old Stone Farmhouse speaking to people and as well as the Shin de Retisseur during that time at the Shin to kind of mm -hmm. bounce back when I was the person selecting wines for the Shin. Like I said, we were doing a, a wine dinner a month, so they ding the glass and I was now speaking in front of so many, 70 people, you know, once a month in tuxedos about wine. So I was very comfortable in hosting these dinners when I started Dionysus. And now, you know, on the business side, really trying to again, monitor cash flow of growing a company of looking at your margins and saying, okay, I need more containers and more wines, but where's that balancing act of paying off the wineries, what we owe them on our you know, 30, 60, 90 day credit terms um, while ordering more wine. And if you're growing a company, really understanding how inventory, by the way, can eat up your working capital um, as you are in any, in any business, quite frankly, distributing, running a winery. So trying to find that happy medium and understanding that we're I'm trying to be um, really cognizant of our expenses. Mm -hmm. And I, I was trying to market, I remember this so well, I was trying to figure out how I can market my wines and my wine dinners and I didn't have a marketing budget. And a guy I, I knew from my time at the Old Stone Farmhouse, uh, he was from Puerto Rico, but he moved to St. Thomas and him and his family happened to own the radio stations in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. So I, I went to him, he owned, uh, one, still owns 104.3, the Buzz radio station. I said, listen, I've got my distributing company. How about uh, I wanna market for my stuff. I've got an idea of starting a, a wine program or a, a wine show on your radio station called Red, White and You and I'll talk about wine and my wines and my wine dinners and now I have the distributing company, so I'm bringing down winemakers and owners down into the Caribbean. And, and it's typically the actual winemaker owner because, you know, they're not, uh, the winery, when they 
say, oh, I've got my distributor in the Virgin Islands wants to do a wine dinner. They're going to go their self. They're not going to send their, their rep. So sure. I say to uh, my friend, Alan Friedman, I say, Alan, let me start this wine show. I'll do it once a week on Sunday mornings, pop a bottle of wine, talk about wine, just make it fun and loose. And, and so he's like, you ever it on the radio? I said, no, but I can figure this out. So now I'm running the wine distributing company, selling wine, starting to hire some sales reps, doing a wine program called Red, White & You, and which, by the way, is really hard if you've never talked on the radio because it's great if you have someone next to you and you're having a conversation, but a lot of times, there was a lot of weeks there wasn't someone up there with me. I had to just talk for 30 plus minutes by myself about wine. So, yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. But I loved it, right? Because I love now, I'm closer connected to wine. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, that was my day in and day out. I'm trying wine, I'm selling it, I'm talking to staff of restaurants, I'm doing wine education classes, I'm hosting you know, at least one if not two wine dinners a week at different, all my different accounts. I expand the company and start selling wine in St. John. So the Virgin Islands is made up of three islands, St. John, St. Thomas, and St. Croix. I go to St. Croix and open up a warehouse. Um, open up a warehouse in St. Croix, it's St. John. I don't have a warehouse, but I'm selling now to the restaurants over there, which there's no road to get to that island. So once a week, I've got to load up a van and get it on a car ferry. And the car ferry takes it over to St. John and my delivery guy runs all over the <laughs> island, type, tries to deliver all the wine before the last car ferry comes <laughs> back. I'm shipping wine on the seaplane over to St. Croix and by boat. Uh, it was so much fun. Um, I didn't do wine, but I really started to diverse the, I didn't do just wine. I wanted to diversify the portfolio because uh, I'm like, you know, we're going to all these accounts. We're selling them wine, but you know, the Caribbean is a very seasonal market. So you need to make your money when you make your money. During hurricane season, there's not a lot of tourists. So I said, we should be selling them more than just wine. So we worked out a deal and started bottling our own water in Trinidad. So we're selling that because you can't drink water out of the sink in the Caribbean. It's all out of cistern. So people drink bottled water. I got a Bloody Mary mix. I started selling cigars from Nicaragua, importing them. I started bringing in sake from Japan and learning a lot about sake. Uh, I picked up some beer brands. And boy, I tell you what, it was so much fun. And at that time, I decided to really diversify my portfolio. And I saw that there was one of the other distributors who wasn't doing a good job with a portfolio of liquor brands. And Brown Foreman Group is a company that owns a lot of different liquors like Stoli Vodka, Jack Daniels, Cuervo. There's 90 plus liquors in their portfolio. And I saw this company doing a terrible job and I'm like, I should be selling that. I've never sold liquor in that capacity before, but I'll figure it out. So start went to that group and started negotiating the rights to those liquor brands. Uh, again, now I'm in my early 30s. Um, I don't know, they, they believed in what I was saying and my partners and I, Jane Shane, we ended up getting exclusive rights to Brown Foreman Group. Now anyone in the Virgin Islands that wants to buy a bottle of Stoli or Jack or Cuervo, all the restaurants, hotels had to get it from our company. So the company explodes. Now we're, we're doing crazy amount of business. Um, still interested in rum. Their largest rum festival in the world is in Old San Juan, Puerto Rico. And of course, I'm tied to the radio station and they're the sponsor of this thing. So they need another media person. So Alan suggests that I'm a judge during my time having the distributing company and do, I have that you know, wine talk show. So the tourism board of Puerto Rico says, yeah, John would be perfect. So now all of a sudden, I'm um, the judge, one of, I think, seven judges for one of the largest rum festivals in the world. So the tourism board of Puerto Rico is flying me over to Old San Juan once a year 
and uh, I'm in El Convento Hotel, if you can imagine, sitting next to Celia Santiago, you know, Ed Hamilton, the Ministry of Rum, the Blend Master of Bacardi, these people that I don't feel, I'm quite frankly qualified <laughs> to be sitting next to these people, but I'm here now, right? And I'm like, okay, let's do this. And it's, it's uh, I know that you're asking me about wine, but it all kind of ties into what, I, what I've done. So I don't know if a lot of people know this, but when you're doing these rum competitions, you literally, I'm in a lock, locked room for eight hours, for three days, um, with the most knowledgeable people in the world about rum. And you serve them in like port glasses. And you have an index card that goes over the port glass. And you're looking at everything you do with wine. You're looking at the color, the viscosity, um, the blendability, the nose, the palate, the mid palate, the finish. You're making notes, you're not talking. Very, very serious. You're, you're doing agricole rums, molasses rums, Down Island rums, uh, XO, you know, d different batches. So you're looking at all different aspects. And, you know, when we're, we weren't judging, we were out and there was flair bartender competitions and, you know, food vendors. It, it was so much fun. Uh, so I'm doing this. My life is crazy uh, at Dionysus. And I had met my wife, Jessica, in the Virgin Islands. Um, and so she was kind of on this journey with me as well. Uh, she was a pastry chef and her and a friend had a... She worked for her friend. They had a, a company called VI Desserts and they were making these crazy big wedding cakes. And anyways, we, we had a great life down there, um, but we had our first child born in the Virgin Islands and we knew we didn't want to raise our kids down there. The schools aren't, you know, it's, it's not as good as they are in the United States. So we made that hard decision to move back to the United States. And I thought, man, I've had such an amazing career so far, what do I want to do when I get to the United States? And I thought this is the perfect opportunity to go straight to where wine's made. Mm -hmm. I want a job at a winery. I want to actually go be there and experience it. Now, mind you, during all, all of my previous experiences that I had mentioned, I was going a lot to wine growing regions around the world. I kind of left that part out. I was, I was going any chance I got to Germany, Spain, France, Italy, Switzerland, Greece, um, Argentina, Chile. Having the distributing company allowed me to go there and do that as well as when I was a sommelier uh, and really going to these wine growing regions and looking at the vineyards and how they're managed and tasting with the winemakers and the sellers of all these wine growing regions. So trying to formulate as well when I'm going to these wineries because I have a business background, how their sales works, um, how their tasting rooms are set up, learning about wine and the viticulture and the, the process of making wine, but also learning how it's sold in these restaurants in Europe and around the world and um, how their business works. Mm -hmm. So when I had the distributing company, I was bringing down, as I said, a lot of owners I was meeting everyone, Philippe Melka, um, Helen Fiona Barnett, Dr. Madaya Ravana, uh, people from Europe. I was meeting all these people. And so when it came time to decide where I wanted to go, um, I had had a great interaction with Dr. Ravana, who is my, my boss now. Mm -hmm. He had flown down to the Virgin Islands as one of our guests because Again, remember I was an officer in the Shindrich Sur, so I wanted to have this big dinner and invite an amazing owner, winemaker, down to be the guest of honor. So I had this fantastic dinner at the Ritz-Carlton in St. Thomas, black tie, 70 people on one table overlooking St. John. Asked Dr. Ivana if he'd come down and work the market with me in St. Croix, St. John, go up to the radio station, do some dinners, but be the guest of honor for this Shin dinner. Uh, it was the induction dinner. It was a big deal. And so he said, yeah, he came down um, and we hit it off when he was down there. We really did. We had a great time together. Uh, I remember when I picked him up in the airport because I had talked to him and some of his people. He just had the winery in Napa at the time. Mm -hmm. um, Alexana wasn't built. Corazon del Sol wasn't built. And we hit it off, had, you know, 
and I knew kind of what he wanted to do because he was making some wine from Alexana, but it was made at Lynn Penner Ash's winery. I know you talked to our winemaker, Brian. Mm -hmm. And so he was making wine. Our first vintage was 2006, but it was made at Penner Ash. So I had their Pinot Gris in Dionysus distributing and I was selling their Pinot Noir and just their Ravana Cab. And so he had said to me, John, uh, this was a year before I decided to leave Island, my wife and I. He's like, hey, listen, I really want to do something in the career, in Argentina. Can you come down there with me? You know, I'll pay your way. Come down, check it out. Um, I'm looking to do some stuff. And I really didn't know. I went back to my wife, Jess, and I'm like, hey, listen, this guy wants me to go. And he happened to want to go because he's a doctor. He's always busy. He wanted to go during Thanksgiving. I'm like, oh, no, what am I going to say to my wife? So I go to Jess and I said, hey, do you mind if I go to South America? She's like, with who? I'm like, remember Dr. Ivana? She's like, what? And I'm like, it'll be fine. When do you want to go Thanksgiving? She's like, oh, it's all right. OK. So I go down to South America during Thanksgiving with Dr. Ivana, not knowing what I'm going to get into. And I get down there. I'm down there for, I think, 10 days with him and still have my distributing company. And within those 10 days, I find out he wants to buy land. He, you know, he's down there, he's starting to make some wine because he he'd bought a little bit of land in 2008 in Argentina and now it's 2010 when I go down there with him and he's wanting to buy some more land. And he's starting to make wine at a custom crush facility. So I go down there with him and Next thing I know, I find myself in a truck with Pab Pablo Jimenez Reilly and uh, Michael Evans, who own a place called the Vines of Mendoza. So it's an hour and a half due south of Mendoza, which again, I've been in Argentina several times, mm -hmm. so I, I feel I kind of know my way around down there. Now we're, I'm walking pieces of land with Dr. Ivana, talking about buying another, you know, he, that's when he, you know, I guess we picked out where the winery now is. He bought that little chunk of land and within that trip, not only did he buy that piece of land, got the land contract and helped him kind of review it and redline it, uh, but we hired an architect. I'd set up, called, you know, I didn't know what, I didn't know any architects down there, found some cool wineries that I had liked uh, from my previous experiences and said, hey, who designed your winery? So had, um, interviewed three architects in Argentina to help Dr. Ivana build this winery, selected one, uh, and in having the distributing company in the Caribbean, one of the importers that I know, Herman Bistue, he's from Argentina, he lives in California, uh, he, you know, I'd met him because I sold his wines down there, I said, hey, this guy, you know, Dr. Ivana is wanting to uh, do this project in Argentina. I think he's going to need an attorney and an accountant. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, I got the perfect guy for you. And that's how we got our attorney and accountant is because I knew this wine importer who grew up, one of his best friends was an attorney in Mendoza, one of the best attorneys. So I introduced Dr. Ivana to his accountant and attorney and, and, uh, yeah, so I know this is, there's a lot going on here, right? So uh, when my wife and I decided to move back to the United States, Dr. Ivana said, you know what, John, I, I want to do something in Oregon. Obviously, you've been to Argentina with me. Um, let's do something together. I'm growing this company. I said, okay. So but before I agreed, he said, I think you should come to Oregon, come to Napa. So again, still living in the Caribbean. I flew here to Alexana. There was nothing here. Um, the vineyard was obviously being planted or planted. The tasting room was just being built. Mm -hmm. The winery was not here. So I w was here for a couple days with him, looked at the project, uh, then left here and went to Napa Valley for his harvest party in Ravana and met the team down there. Um, loved Dr. Ravana, loved the team. Went back to the Caribbean, said, let's do this. He offered me a job. So I packed up my wife and 
my six month old, year old, from the Virgin Islands and sold all my material possessions <laughs> and did it again, just like I moved down to the Virgin Islands with nothing but a suitcase. We flew back to the United States mainland with nothing, no car, nothing, zero, just a suitcase. Landed and was off to the races. So I was hired initially as the national sales manager for the few wines he was making at Alexana um, and Ravana Cab. Mm -hmm. uh, but after a few months, was promoted to national sales manager and general manager of Alexana as it's being built. Um, sold my shares of the company in, in uh, the Caribbean, so Dianess Distributing went to Jay and Shane, and so I didn't have, I wanted to focus all my attention and give it to Dr. Ivana. Dr. Ivana is an amazing person and human being. He's very humble, he's very gracious, but um, wants the best, and I really liked his philosophy. I, I had offers, by the way, to work with some pretty prominent um, owners and winemakers in Napa and Washington, but really like Dr. Ivana's vision and what he wanted to do. And the idea that I could get to work for not just one winery, but be involved in three projects. Um, and what that was gonna mean in the way of management and sales and marketing on a global scale. Uh, and it was now really exciting to be in yet another startup so doing Yacht Haven Grand as a startup, Dionysus Distributing as a startup company, now hitting another startup, and there was just a couple people working for him in Napa, there was two people working in Oregon, we had a tasting room in Carleton while this was being built. You know, I was about, I think, six months hired before Brian, mm -hmm. our winemaker, but it was, it was Great to see Dr. Ivana's vision of not wanting to cut corners, wanting to have a really high-end focus, more on quality than quantity. And knowing what he wanted to do, uh, it was exciting time in and also have Brian on board. Brian is a, an amazing winemaker. We're so lucky to have him here and to see what, you know, how, see him grow and work with Lynn and to now start to build out this business and be a part of that process of, okay, now we have a tasting room. Let's hire people. Um, we're building out a portfolio. What's our price point of our wines gonna be? What's our production level gonna be? To things that you, maybe the non-glamorous part of, okay, let's talk about compliance and taxes and interstate taxes mm -hmm. and what kind of POS and platform are we gonna use and what's our digital processes are gonna be? What where are we gonna store our wine? Where's, where's the warehouses? What's the warehouse costs look like? What's our transportation? Let's look at our distribution model and how Dr. Ivana envisions the growth of the winery. How's that tie into where are we gonna sell it? Mm -hmm. How much is it gonna go to direct to consumer? How much is it gonna go into the three tier system? How do we uh, diversify our risk? I think is an important thing when you, when you start looking at uh, managing a winery. So now, you know, it's, it's a really, really exciting time because I'm driving into beautiful wine country every day for work. And my office is in the vineyard and winery and the business side predominantly and, and uh, you know, being exposed to harvest every day while it's happening in real time and not just visiting Bordeaux mm -hmm. for two weeks and watching harvest and leaving. Um, so that was, boy, I tell you what, it's been uh, uh, an amazing experience because once we started building this out and the second we finished it, Argentina was really kind of happening almost simultaneously, but really once we finished hammering in the last nail at Alexana, shifted gears and moved to South America. And at that time I started flying down to Argentina, I think the most in one year was seven, seven or eight times. Um, and Brian really, really was an uh, integral part of helping me down there. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple employees, you know, Jeff Lewis, who I'll talk about in a second, you know, going down to South America now and uh, overseeing with Brian and these people we started to hire, the building of, of a company in Argentina, 
and as a, having, you know, working for a, a guy that's a U.S. citizen, but starting a company down there of getting the licensing and permits and ho trying to hold title of land and buy winery equipment. Where are you going to get the winery equipment? How are you going to get boxes? Who does labels in Mendoza? Let's go to all these people that make these labels. Look at the price point. Look at the quality. Mm -hmm. How are we going to set up distribution and POS systems and how are you going to get internet? Uh, where we decided to build that didn't have electricity. I know you'd mentioned, you talked to Brian or when you interviewed him, we were on diesel generator for quite a few years. Um, I can talk intimately on starting that company and starting the company here while, you know, helping with Napa. It's been, a, it's been a crazy time. I've been with Dr. Ivana now nine years, almost 10 years. Um, after, so I was promoted a few months into it to, you know, as I said, I was doing national sales and general manager of Alexana. And then about six months later, was promoted to oversee uh, as the general manager for all three wineries. Mm -hmm. So now I have my hands in managing and overseeing Napa Valley and obviously Argentina and Oregon and slowly starting to build a team mm -hmm. and expand our footprint globally on where we sell wine and how we do business, being really involved with um, the financial side, the P&L statements, the cash flow statements, watching our expenses, our working capital um, while giving the autonomy to grow and mm -hmm. be forward thinking, looking at marketing and brand equity um, and s being conscious of our working capital and knowing how Dr. Ivana wanted to grow mm -hmm. and see a, a return on his investment, but also doing it on a, a very conscious thought process of not growing too fast. So, you know, starting with a very, very small team where there was a few people that we all kind of did everything to slowly building up where, okay, now we can hire someone just for a wine club, and but they're gonna also do shipping and digital marketing and wine club and tasting room to growing into what we are now where we have different heads of each department um, we've expanded dramatically. We sell wine in around 40 states and uh, I don't know, geez, close to 12 countries from Thailand to Tokyo to Hong Kong to Denmark, uh, of course, the Virgin Islands. Um, I would hope so. And really thinking about how we can structure our business that it's in a unique way when you, when you really When you look at the wine business, now I can apply kind of, you know, what I've studied in college, what I have my degrees in, my experiences in startups leading up to this, um, working at a, a wine shop in Missoula, Montana, to being a sommelier on the floor, to ha owning and managing a distributing company, now to seeing this process, I think allowed me to look um, through a different lens mm -hmm. in the wine industry to really check those boxes of having those experiences on how to sell wine and what the wine shop's looking for, what the restaurant's looking mm -hmm. for. I try to do my best on, you know, managing people and, and uh, keeping them engaged and forward thinking. Um, so it's, it's been a wild, wild ride. It's been a lot of fun, uh, but it, it, all comes back to wine mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know that idea of something that's grown from the ground that really was fascinating as I started learning more and reading more going to these countries I knew I wanted to be located in Oregon and the reason we chose to live in Oregon over Napa is because when I grew up in Montana and I felt that this was the closest to home I could find with the mountains and the beautiful trees. Mm -hmm. But also, I saw what was happening in the Oregon wine industry back when I was a sommelier at the Old Stone Farmhouse. I started seeing examples of some really cool producers, um, Ken Wright being one of them, and um, some of these iconic 
producers in Oregon seeing what kind of wine they could put out mm -hmm. and the quality level, mm -hmm. but understanding that Oregon was at its infancy and I wanted to be a part of that revolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really saw, or I thought I saw, the trajectory of what Oregon was gonna do, and that was a big factor of why we moved to Oregon and not Napa. Mm -hmm. It's quite a story. <laughs> yeah, so, so my day-to-day -day now is the president of Ravana Wines and really work with Dr. Ravana and um, the team to oversee all, all three wineries, but um, kind of the idea of what, what the future looks like and not just what the next week or next month or next year, but what the next three or five years look like and how are we going to get there. I'm going to ask you about that in a minute, but before I get there, I'm curious about the kind of unique challenges that come. You, you mentioned some of the like the startup challenges for starting a winery in Oregon, starting a winery in Argentina. What are some of the unique challenges that come from running three different wineries in three, three su such different locations and with such sort of different focuses? What, what, is, uh, what are the challenges unique to your position that maybe others wouldn't, wouldn't be aware of? Well, it's lack of time, number one. Time management, lack of time is by far the, the hardest. I feel fortunate that we have, in my opinion, the best team and employees you could find anywhere. The, the team really makes a company, you know, the employees make a company. Mm -hmm. you, you see the owner's vision and what he wants to do and he gives you the resources. The winemaker, Brian, is exceptional you know the wines because Dr. Ravana has given us these resources is fantastic and when you put the right people in place and give them the creative freedom to step outside the box and really be a part of that process of growing and let them have a voice mm -hmm. in it mm -hmm. and the collaboration um, is fantastic but the hard part is time management because there's three different wineries located and you know they're not an easy drive away uh, Argentina takes 26 hours to get there on my way into work today I was speaking with one of our employees in London and uh, our winemaker in Argentina so trying to allocate my time to what department and where the hot spot is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Depending on the time of the year, uh, there's different needs and wants and things that are happening in, in the wine industry mm -hmm. and in the wine business, whether it be in vineyard, vineyard contracts, looking at our vineyard contracts in relation to our production schedule and where we want to go, um, analyzing sales histories and talking to the wine club manager, the shipping coordinator, the tasting room manager, our sample pours, national sales, on-premise, off-premise, understanding the life cycle of each wine and where it goes and trying to think about being conscious of our costs and our expenses and not making too much of one wine. So, you know, depending on the time of year, whether it be we're redoing our website or we're trying to open a new state, so trying to figure out where my time's best, so keeping a detailed calendar and how to keep all the brands tied in together as one unit but mm -hmm. have their own identities mm -hmm. but also keep everyone on the same page because I feel vertically integrating and pollinating the company and the employees is really really smart so you can have an employee grow that might want to learn about Napa or Argentina and utilize their skill set and let let them benefit of of what we have in our, in our company, but also understanding there needs to be an, an open lines of communication so everyone's on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, so time management and making sure you're, making sure you're uh, you know, there when people are needed. I, I work a lot and my phone's never off. <laughs> so there is no weekend, there is no, mm -hmm. people need stuff all the time and have questions and you want to be there for them. So I guess it's that 
it's that time management. Um, another hard part would just be the growth of our company, uh, understanding all the moving parts of managing one winery, let alone three. How's that tie into the big picture? Mm -hmm. And does it make sense for the company in that way? Meaning you, you have a new wine for, a, you know, is it going to go to direct to consumer? Is it going to go to the three tier system? Is it go to club? Um, how do you communicate that to all the employees? How do you communicate that to the customers? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really a big picture job when you manage a winery um, that you need to take a step back and have a good understanding of, of all the moving parts of finance, accounting, compliance, uh, legal, uh, vineyard contracts, production, sales, digital marketing, human resources. Um, but, it, but it's exciting because at any given time, you're taking off one hat and putting on the next. So it's, it's, there is never a dull moment. It's, it's never the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love it. Mm -hmm. Because you can do a lot of things in the wine industry, but when you get into management and working directly for a winery, and, and if you are lucky enough to be a general manager or a president, you get to dip your hands in all the cookie jars. You're not just focused on sales or marketing mm -hmm. or production. You get a glimpse of everything. You talked about Dr. Ravana's vision being one of the things that, that drew you here. Tell me, describe the vision for me, and I'm, I'm also sort of curious about the pressure that comes with trying to execute someone else's vision uh, on, that, on that kind of scale. Sure. It's asking a lot of questions. It's ha you know, having a clear picture and understanding exactly what Dr. Ravana wants to do. And Dr. Ravana, I'm so lucky and fortunate to work with someone like Dr. Ravana. As I said, he puts a lot of trust into all of his employees and understanding that his journey into wine, becoming a cardiologist and uh, working his way from quite frankly nothing, um, but then being able to afford the finer things in life and the finer wines is you know, knowing that that's what his vision is. When he first started his property in Napa, mm -hmm. he didn't want to just make a really good Cabernet in Napa or just the best cab in Napa. He wanted to make the best wine in the world mm -hmm. because he was so accustomed at that point of drinking some of the finer wines around the world. So if he's going to do something, he wants to do it right. Mm -hmm. And you really want to work for a guy like that. He doesn't want to cut corners. If it takes longer to get to that point, Instead of that straight line, he wants to take it that longer path and make sure that no matter what he does, it's to the best of our ability. So understanding that and taking him on that journey where we can take that path of trying to do the best we possibly can in every aspect of the business. But if you don't have a clear picture on how to get there with expectations mm -hmm. of timeline on how fast he wants to get there um, understanding that you've got to control a budget and expenses to get to that point because typically to get to that point you want to get to it's going to cost you something um, so asking a lot of questions so you're on the same page mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is important Describe for me the the differences between the three different the three different wineries. What what is what is kind of unique? What are unique characteristics about the three, and, and what are they what are they bringing to the table? Wow. Well, you know, Ravana initially in Napa it, it had its own identity when I started. Um, you know, he bought the land in '97, planted it in '98. First vintage was 2001. Um, so it, it had established itself and I think the portfolio as his sixth vintage won best cab in the world in Wine Spectator. It was number four in the top 100, so it had a lot of acclaim and draw, you know, he drew a lot of attention from not just the United States but around the world. 
um, from sommeliers, wine buyers, collectors. Mm -hmm. So it's very fortunate to, when you look at creating on the business side, a brand like Alexana and Corazon, that once you introduce Alexana, people are customers and buyers and employees are already under the impression that it is a Ravana product, mm -hmm. that it's going to be at the highest level possible. So I think the identity of Alexana took to that and as well as Corazon del Sol. Mm -hmm. So that was nice to have that as a platform. But to really look at it, it is different. You know, it, they're completely different, by the way. Uh, Ravana's business model is really heavily directed towards the consumer and the collector on a very, very high scale. Um, it's a tiny acre vineyard. There's only 8.2 acres. We don't, that's it. So we're making a very small amount of wine. We are making a little bit wine of wine from single vineyards now, but the production levels are so small and it's allocated across the United States. Um, but to a lot of collectors, it's, it's been around for a while. So there's a huge demand for that wine. Mm -hmm. It's very easily sells out. Um, so the, the business model of who you're dealing with and what wine auctions you're going to and who you're interacting with kind of set that stage for Alexana of, okay, we're, we're not gonna go into entry level wine. The winery wasn't designed or built that way. We have a lot of two and three ton fermenters. Typically when you make, decide to build a winery, I'd like to think people say, okay, well, what kind of wine do I wanna produce? Do I want just a very approachable, very affordable wine that I want to distribute around the United States? Or am I not concerned about putting the wine everywhere? I just want to make a little bit of wine that is the best quality I can. Mm -hmm. So when you decide to make wine in two and three ton fermenters and you have your own estate vineyard, you're not making massive amounts the financial part of running a winery and the expenses associated with making wine in two and three ton fermenters, the amount of employees you need and interns you need to do that. Um, the wine deserves to go into nicer packaging. The wine deserves to go into the sellers or collectors. Um, so, you know, understanding the brand, identi the brand identity as a whole and keeping the brand equity high and knowing that Dr. Ravana doesn't want to cut corners, it's really easy to say, okay, we're not going to spare any expense in the vineyard, our winemaking equipment. Now that ties into the business side, how we host guests, where we host guests. Um, but our understanding that, you know, that your price point and your sales channels need to be in a way that is ties into your brand, but not overreaching, I think is important. Um, so Alexana, as it kind of established itself, it made sense as we started to get first time customers coming to the winery that didn't know about us because mm -hmm. we're a different now brick and mortar mm -hmm. and location, but also again, cross pollinating the brands right from the start because we had the attention of all of our customers in Napa, introducing them digitally mm -hmm. to Alexana, uh, really tied the brand together. Um, now Argentina, again being a completely different brand, but using that same platform is what we did with Alexana, we did it with Ravana mm -hmm. and Corazon del Sol. Mm -hmm started to tie all the brands together by cross-pollinating our customers and knowing that, again, building out the vineyard and the winery to do that on the, you know, the highest scale possible, the best equipment, the best vineyard practices, and do our best to make a, an example of what that vineyard site can do mm -hmm. without cutting any corners. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm proud to say I think we've done a fabulous job connecting all the brands, but they are different. They have different identities. They do have slightly different customers. They're different price points. They're completely different categories. The Napa clientele 
is looking for cab. That's a def different demographic that you're going to find in Argentina and in Oregon. Um, however, I do see a lot more crossover happening over the last few years. Um, not necessarily the, the cab drinkers, Napa cab drinkers want Napa cab, but you're seeing, starting to see a crossover more of people that were traveling to Napa are coming to Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, and also the identity of, of Argentina is so far out in left field because of its location, the country, how we sell wine, and where we're selling wine, we're importing. We, get, we started our, an importing mm -hmm. company, so we're the importers of our wines coming into the United States. Um, so we're in control of that process. So selling Corazon del Sol to our current distributors and club members and tasting rooms customers here in the United States, but also open the door to other locations that I don't know if we would have gotten to as fast as we did if we didn't have the Corazon del Sol project, meaning selling wine in Brazil, selling wine in Panama, Peru, Uruguay, some of these countries that already do business with Argentina, but didn't consider Oregon or Napa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. You're doing a battery? Okay. Do you mind if I take a restaurant restroom oh, break? Absolutely, yeah. Just un unclip your microphone and we'll, we're, we're uh, just got a couple questions left for you. Yeah, no problem. Perfect. How's it going so far? Great. Fantastic. <laughs> it's most, the most, this is the most business as one we've ever had. We're learning a lot about wine business. Mm -hmm. I'll be right back. Take one second. Perfect. Right. So, you talked earlier about uh, Oregon and uh, and sort of seeing it seeing it on the rise when you wanted to deciding to move here. Tell me about what you've seen in the Oregon industries in the, in the in the decade or so you've been here. What it looks like now compared to what it looks like when when you got into the Oregon wine industry. Well, there's a lot more vineyards and wineries popping up than when I first moved here. Um, it's fascinating. I absolutely love it. Um, what when I first came here. Uh, I'll take it on the financial side, the cost of land was quite a bit less. Uh, you were typically finding a planted vineyard would sell for 40,000 an acre, 50,000 an acre. Uh, now it's 90 to $110,000 an acre. Unplanted land I'm seeing go now for 30,000 an acre and it was a lot cheaper mm -hmm. back then. So the cost of land is going up, farming costs are going up, uh, but that's, that's a sign that we're doing it right, in my opinion, because when you look at the economics and the financial part about what's happening, number one, I think, I mean, I think I noticed it when I was a sommelier in the Caribbean, the quality of the wines that were coming out of Oregon back then were impressive, mm -hmm. very, very impressive. And I think if you look back at the examples of the last 15, 20, 25 years, you're, you're gonna see mm -hmm. Oregon has evolved in a way that is, I think, defining its own path and its own place. It, it's creating a, you know, a spot on the stage in the global wine world. And that's because the, I think, you know, it ties into the, the climate, the soils, the elevation, the whole terroir of Oregon and what we can do here. And then people's interest in it. Mm -hmm. um, so knowing that the quality of wine was amazing then and people recognize that. So you're finding more and more people coming here from all over the world, uh, you name it. It's a very, very fast growing wine region. More so, I think, than a lot of other places. Not just because of the quality, because it's fairly relatively affordable to still do business here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is examples of affordability in California still, not necessarily in Napa, um, but parts of Central Valley and Coombsville where Washington State's really affordable, um, but they've taken a different path than Oregon. Oregon is true to itself that 
I'm really excited that they've focused on Pinot Noir. They're, you know, for the most part, is Pinot Noir. Obviously, we all know that there's other varietals grown here, but Pinot Noir is what it's really known for. And because it decided, Oregon decided to focus on that and hone in the skills of Pinot Noir, really elevated its voice. Mm -hmm. Whereas Washington State, oh, they make a great Merlot, they make a great Riesling. Have you tried their Syrah? I don't know, I love their Cabernet. It never defined its path. I love Washington State wine and they're, you know, it is a, has a voice in, in the global wine world. Um, but because it's not known for one thing, like Bordeaux is, like Burgundy is, like Champagne is, mm -hmm. south of France, I mean, you go on and on, all these wine growing regions, even when you look at Italy, uh, Alto Adige and Valpolicella, um, Barolo, they're focused on one or a couple varietals. Mm -hmm. So Oregon, you know, has changed quite a bit. Uh, I think the collaboration between the vineyard managers, the winemakers, uh, the people in, in management collaborate so much to, as, as one, to, to kind of elevate the voice of the Oregon wine community and it's working really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, I love the idea of, you know, people from France and Spain and Germany, um, California moving in here. You see it happening, you feel it, people are talking about it. Mm -hmm. But it's an exciting time to be here. It's validating what Oregon has done. It's mm -hmm. validating that we're doing it right. It's drawing attention that people are interested in coming here because it is affordable. Mm -hmm. And, you, and, and I, I see on the sales side, it's expanding dramatically, not just in the United States, but around the world. You know, we sell a considerable amount of wine in, in Thailand, which I never thought we would in Denmark and Canada and the Virgin Islands and all sorts of different com uh, countries, you know, Asia. People are reaching out to us interested in it. Mm -hmm. And when I um, travel around the world for the company, people are, people are recognizing what we're doing. So, uh, you know, the money coming in here to buy plant, you know, buy land, plant the vineyard, um, it's just elevating it. Mm -hmm. Prices are going up, but I think to a certain point, it's going to not necessarily stabilize, but I think it'll keep crawling up and up and up, um, which will in turn slightly keep pushing the price of the wines up. There are some companies coming in and trying to make uh, more Oregon Pinot and affordable, and I think they'll be able to do a good job at that, but I don't know if they'll ever get to the level of what some of the Central Coast wineries and some of these couple million case wineries are doing in California just because Oregon Pinot doesn't like to be made in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a fascinating time to be in Oregon. What about as you look ahead for the industry? What is Oregon going to look like over the next five to ten years? It's, it's going to keep growing. Uh, You know, seeing Oregon, people take the wines more and more seriously on their wine lists. Mm -hmm. um, customers that were once going to Sonoma and Napa and Burgundy, realizing that Oregon has wines that are as good, if not better, than some of these other wine growing regions that are making Pinot Noir. It's an eye-opener. Mm -hmm. It is a huge eye-opener. And that is because of this amazing community that Oregon has. It's drawing so much attention to wine critics, reviewers, people like you guys are doing a great job putting that word out there with digital and video. Um, so it's, it's only going to get better. And I think, I think that uh, the quality of the wine is going to keep getting elevated as we do such a good job on trials, on experiments, on how we can farm the vineyard, and also trials in the winery, on fermentations, um, yeasts, different processes that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the ability because 
for the most part, a lot of Oregon wineries are making small lot ferments that you can take two tons of grapes and do something that you've never done before with your vineyard and see if it makes a better wine. And then collaborate with some of the events and collaborations we do with Oregon Pinot Camp and uh, IPNC and even the barrel auction and things that are happening. Um, uh, winemakers talking to other winemakers and saying, oh, I did this during this vintage and understanding that uh, there isn't one vintage that's the same in Oregon, but how you handle <laughs> how you handle what Mother Nature gives you each vintage and how you can make a better wine. Mm -hmm. So the quality is going to keep going up. You know, one thing that I I'm always an optimist and try to think of um, the positive things and as you know we're in a pandemic right now but Oregon is going to come out of this way stronger than it did coming in and the reason I say that is it's almost a blessing if you look at what Napa Valley is right now and that's why I, I, I love my position so much because I get to see the industry in Napa Valley and I get to see the industry in Argentina and Oregon and I've always loved that um, it's a, I guess it's a love-hate thing. Napa is in a position where it is so popular globally. There's so many tourists going there. They're doing so well with tourism. The price of wine's really high. Farming costs are really high there. It's reservation only, right? So it's, it's more structured. You get to build those relationships with the, the customer. Your touch points are different, mm -hmm. opposed to just a walk-in where you can just walk into a winery with no reservation. You don't know much about that customer before they get there, mm -hmm. right? They walk in, you do the tasting, they leave, depending on how good your, um, you know, your direct to consumer business is and your touch points on that customer journey of getting to know them and staying connected to them, depending on how you do that. But you know, a lot of Oregon's are walk-in only uh, for tourism and their direct to consumer program. There's also a handful that are reservation only. And I've always wanted to do that at Alexon, and I think the team has as well to make it reservation only, but you're always so scared financially of losing that part of the mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this pandemic has sh obviously shut everyone down. So as it is opening back up and we're taking these safety precautions and realizing, um, we need to take reservation because we need to control the flow of traffic, mm -hmm. being socially distanced and spacing. We're understanding, we understood how that process worked because that's how we did it in Napa. It's reservation only, our touch points, how we take those reservations, what do we say to them, um, how many groups you have at one time, what we say to them after. So implementing those processes now here in Oregon in particular at Alexana has elevated the experience. It's elevated our engagement with the customer. Mm -hmm. We're now more of a, you know, telling that story one-on-one. -on -one. They have our undivided attention. Customers are coming out with intent to buy. Um, you're, you're, you're able to tell your story in a more effective way. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of wineries after this don't keep reservation only because we're seeing a great engagement with our customers. Mm. Um, and on the financial side, it's, it's working out great. You know, these people are buying fantastic, all of our fantastic high-end wines. They're, they're, you know, I think the average per person price points going up of these spends. And it's because you, you know, you're engaging with that customer in a different way than you did before. Mm. So over the next few years, you're gonna see the Oregon wine industry keep growing you're going to see more foreigners and outsiders coming in and planting more vineyards and buying wineries and consolidating. Uh, you're going to get a lot more attention in these live auctions and on a global stage of expansion and export to other countries. Um, you know, I think there's going to be more tourism coming into Oregon, which is exciting for all of us. They're starting to realize the, what Oregon has to offer beyond just wine. It's an amazing place to live and raise a family and work and be a part of that community, which is so important to Oregon, unlike any other wine growing region I've seen. 
We don't, we don't really want that getting out, though. Tourism is one. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. We don't want them to stay, necessarily. Right. That's awesome. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned the pandemic, obviously. Uh, and, and I'm curious about, from your role, what has what else has had to change? What, else, what about business has changed for you and your role since the shutdown in, in, in March, and what continues to change today? Sure. Well, uh, you know, it, it caught everyone off guard, obviously. Um, I don't think anyone really quite knew how to react to it. Um, yeah, you, everyone had to, obviously we were shut down, so you had to take a step back and say, okay, this is interesting. How do we continue business? Um, how do we do it uh, safely for our employees and our customers, mm -hmm. effectively? Um, but for me watching, I think the biggest part was looking at the financial impact and saying, okay, if restaurants are closed, um, you don't, the expense of that inventory and the cost to make that wine for those restaurants, now that sales channel shut down. So we've got that additional cost um, in money not coming in. But I feel we've positioned ourselves in a really good way leading into this, that most of our business is direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. So understanding how you know, the wine business works and being afforded the ability to work in so many different um, arenas within the wine industry as I have. Uh, I know this and knew this going into it that I've, I always feel that no matter what business you do in life, but in particular wine, you want to diversify your risk. And never forget that, right? So, what does that mean? You can apply that to every single part of your business and you want to diversify your risk for possible uh, chances of something happening and you losing um, that, that money coming in and that profit mm -hmm. and your expenses going out. You want to minimize it as much as you can. That's why people ask, well, you don't make I didn't think you made enough wine to sell to all those countries and all those states. But by giving it to a lot of different states and countries, but really focusing on your direct to consumer, mm -hmm. um, now you have a nice even playing field with uh, selling it to different places, money coming in. So if a hurricane hits Texas like it did a year or two ago, you know, okay, that's terrible, but all of our sales weren't in Texas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so it does hurt a company, but not as much as it should. So understanding that, you know, we've diversified our risk, but this, this, was, a, this was a tough thing to navigate. I'll be honest with you, it was really, really challenging mm -hmm. um, to say, okay, restaurants are shut down, the three tier system shut down. We were very fortunate to have a strong following in our direct to consumer. Um, we had already, as a company, started to focus on the analytics of the business and studying analytics in a way in, uh, that applies to digital campaigns and how we interact with customers and what connects customers to our wines and our mm -hmm. brand and what that emotional connection is. So really looking at the demographics of people and how we speak to them and our touch points. We had started studying that well before this pandemic happened. So knowing that that was one of the sales channels open, like all wineries, they started focusing on what they could control and where they could sell their wines. But that was something that we had done in the past and done very well. Mm -hmm. So we were very fortunate to keep sales extremely healthy and vibrant during this last few months. Um, and it, you know, again, it goes back to the team you create. Uh, I couldn't have done any of this without the team we have at all three wineries. I am so grateful and thankful every day for our winemakers, our vineyard managers, and all the sales teams and directors and managers we have in every department and our sales managers that are spread out across the United States and our team in Argentina. Because if you hire people 
and you believe in them and, and allow them that flexibility and creative freedom and have a voice, mm -hmm. they, they will do what they know is right. And we've made it through this extremely well because of our team, mm -hmm. that we have qualified people that know what they're doing and we trust them to do what they know to do. Mm -hmm. um, and our loyal customers and the wine, you know, we have a great following. So, yeah, I, f I feel that we've, we've done a great job. Um, but boy, I tell you what, it, w it was stressful. Um, it's a lot of communication, but typically my head was buried for the first few weeks in the financial part, mm -hmm. I'll, be, I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I had to rely on the general managers to really look at uh, and talk to each department and channel my time and my time management to just those department heads and not interact as much as I wanted to with every single person um, because I was on limited time trying to look at the financial part of the business and what the next steps were with production, production plan, grape contracts, looking at our national sales programs, uh, working with the winemakers on that production schedule and how we're gonna move our wine around and really do an internal audit on our expenses and where we could cut the fat, where we could uh, look at different opportunities of sales channels were open. But I, honestly, at least for us, and I think it would go with a lot of businesses, not just wine, that people really looked at their business in a different way because you had to and fine-tuned it. And the businesses that are gonna come out of this are gonna be much stronger than they were when they went in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On that note, what do you see as you look ahead for, for yourself and for obviously all three wineries, but specifically in this case, Alexana, what's gonna happen in the next five, 10 years for to the Ravana group, I guess? Well, I'm really excited about the future. Um, I couldn't be more happy with uh, working for Dr. Ravana, um, his vision just to elevate what we're doing at all times, just to revisit everything. How we're managing the vineyard, how we're making wine, our packaging, our sales efforts, our marketing efforts. So understanding that is really, really uh, important to look at the future. Uh, Brian, every year, is putting out some amazing wine. So I'm excited to see what he's going to do and understanding that he knows that our trajectory is just to get better and better. Um, you know, our, our sales channels are getting broader and wider. I think we're selling in different countries and different states, but we're seeing a lot of different people coming in for tourism in Oregon, which is exciting. You know, for Alexana in particular, we're building uh, an addition to our tasting room to host guests, but not more guests but elevate our experience to do more private tastings and experiences. And you know what, Be even before the pandemic of private experiences and social distance, we'd started the design and the building of this before this even hit. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to open up the new tasting room we're building. We also, Dr. Ivana bought a 64 acre piece of land just over the hill here. Uh, so we're clearing it and planted nine acres uh, with the idea of planning 31 more. Uh, so I see us starting a new brand mm -hmm. over there. Uh, and to be now a part of yet another project is really exciting. And I think Alexana is on a path of its own. And now it's our job to just step out of the way and let it grow, let it grow into what it, I think it's going to become, uh, you know, something that has a voice within the Oregon, industry, Oregon wine industry mm -hmm. and it's let the wines speak of the place that it comes from. This, this vineyard site is really unique and interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really uh, special orientation geographically within the Willamette Valley of being in Dundee Hills and you know Yamhill Carlton esque, mm -hmm. but have so many different personalities within that vineyard. That as we see this vineyard yes. become more established and developed, 
you know, as vineyards age, you see them go through this evolution that is amazing. The depth and the concentration and the ageability and the longevity of the wines from older vineyard sites, uh, the complexity of the wines is fascinating. So as this vineyard ages, I'm so happy to see it um, evolve in the glass. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, well, that's all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover today that we should have covered? No, that was, that was great. I appreciate you coming by. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time, appreciate your stories and hospitality here in the beautiful day. And uh, we'll let you off the hook.